Good morning, First Baptist Church members and our virtual viewers and any other guests that we may have to our season of Advent as we celebrate joy. Let me share a scripture with you. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. This comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 12. Amen. If you were about me for a word of prayer and thanksgiving, Lord God, we want to thank you, Lord, for allowing us to have this another incredible, blessed morning to be able to worship you, Lord God. And in this of everything that's been going on as we wind down, it's been a wild and crazy year, Lord God, in 2020. We thank you for helping us not to panic in the natural because of the supernatural, Heavenly Father. Thank you for not being able to depend on the natural, but to depend on you, Lord God, a supernatural God that has. We've seen the five physics by walking on the water, Lord God. We've seen you defy chemistry by turning that water into wine, Lord God. We've seen you defy economics by healing yes. and, and feeding the 5,000 with just a little bit of food, Lord God. And most of all, we have seen you, Lord God, defy biology by being born of a virgin, Lord God, which we celebrate this Christmas week and ultimately resurrecting from the dead, Lord God. So thank you for the confidence that you've given us, and that confidence is our salvation in Christ, Lord God. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
now time for giving. And we want you to know that giving is based on what you have and not what you don't have. Amen. But here is the key. You want to be a cheerful giver. Amen. Don't give reluctantly. Don't give with a thought, well, should I, can I give this much? Give whatever is on your heart and give it with cheer. Now, this comes from Corinthians 8, 12, and 9, uh, 9 ch uh, chapter 9, verse 7. Give with joy.
before I preach, I want to wish certainly our members and our virtual guests a uh, very early Merry Christmas. This is Sunday uh, before Christmas, and we know each and every Sunday is the day uh, that the Lord has made. Uh, this is a very special Sunday uh, in the life and even in the calendar of the church. With it being Christmas, we know that Christmas is a season of not only giving, uh, not only sharing, but I gotta make some confessions and I'm not gonna call no names. We did some recording at my mother's house on Friday. And my mother made a cobbler for somebody, and that person said they wasn't gonna share with their household. Amen. Yes, yes. Amen. <laughs> this is a season of giving and also sharing. But I got another confession to make. Uh, as pastor from First Baptist Church, North Tulsa, during the holiday season, two things I look forward to. Uh, Sister Dorothy Henderson makes me snack mix, but she told me this year I could not come and get it all by myself because I don't share it with my family. But she's holding it hostage until I make a public announcement that I don't share it with my family. So I promise if you let me come get my snack mix, I'm going to share it. One more confession, and I'll preach. Sister Carolyn McConnell, she makes cookies for me every Christmas. Yeah. Haven't gotten my cookies. Now, one year, Sister McConnell, she, you made me two dozen, but the delivery driver, your husband only brought me one dozen. <laughs> so I've got a sneaky suspicion that you made my cookies, but they haven't been delivered. So I made three confessions, and one of them included me. Amen. <laughs> All right, it's preaching time. Amen. Amen. I'm going to call my attention to the Gospel of John, the second chapter, and I'm going to be reading just the 10th verse. The Gospel of John, the second chapter, uh, just reading verse 10. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests had well drunk, then the inferior. But he made an observation, you have kept the good wine until now. Uh, my friends, I want to talk about the best is yet to come. Amen. Best is yet to come. Uh, I don't know about you, but during the holiday season or any time of the year, I like pie. Amen. One time there was a teacher talking to his students. He told them, he said, guess what, I'm going to teach you today how to eat pie. One little boy said, what do you mean? I know how to eat pie. And the teacher said, well, how do you eat it? He said, well, most people start with the pointed end, and then they eat their way to the crust. But he said, I don't like to do it that way because I like the filling the most. So what I do is I start with the crust. And then I eat to the pointed end because I want to save the best for last. And what we find in our text, we find uh, our Lord in this, his first miracle, saving the best for last. And my brothers and my sisters, as we celebrate the birth of Christ, and even my brothers and sisters, as you think about what you have been through in 2020, I've got some good news for you today. God not only saved the best for last in his word, but God saves the best for last in your life. Guess what? I know you've been through some hills and valleys. I know you've been over some mountains that seem too hard to climb. But God is a God that no matter how bad it has been in your life, he is saving the best. Amen. This text, my brothers and sisters, is the first miracle of our Lord when our Lord turned water into wine. But notice, Jesus didn't specifically call it a miracle, he called it a sign. And my friends, we need to understand the importance of what this text is teaching us and teaching the church. Miracles in Scripture are usually referred to either as wonders, signs, powers, or simply works. Miracle, my brothers and sisters, 
is first of all a wonder. Uh, and when it is called a wonder, it speaks to the astonishment that comes upon the beholder when the miracle takes place. Whenever it is called a sign, it is a token and an acknowledgement of the presence of God. Whenever it is called a power, it uh, draws our attention to uh, the origin of the miracle. And whenever it is called a work, it is meant to imply that somebody who did it is greater than man. Whether it be supernatural or natural, we must understand that God works in both. And when God works in both, we must understand that it is not a different miracle, but a different or greater manifestation of the same work that God does. For instance, the hand of God is at work in the natural, and the hand of God is at work in the supernatural. Here is the difference. The finger of God is concealed when God works in the natural. When God makes the sun come up every morning, his finger, his hand is concealed. When God allows uh, the moon to shine at night, it is a miracle of nature, but the hand of God is concealed. But when God performs the supernatural, just like in our text, his hand is not concealed, it is revealed. Because God is wanting the world to know without any mistake that it was God who did it. And my brothers and sisters, you are a living and walking miracle in 2020 because it was the hand of God. It was the grace of God. It was the mercy of God that has brought you to this point. And I know you've cried some tears. I know you've experienced some grief and some pain, but I want you to know in December, the last month of the year, God has saved the best Last. Look at our text. It's Jesus performing, uh, transforming of the water to wine. First, we see that it reveals the interest of Jesus in the common and the ordinary. It reveals that Jesus is interested in the common and the ordinary. He is interested in our ordinary joys. He is interested in our ordinary sorrows. How do I know that? Because this is a very ordinary event. Look at the scene. It is a wedding. But we don't know who the bride is and we don't even know who the groom. Whenever have you been to a wedding and you don't know who the bride and groom are? It is taught and tailored to teach us that it does not matter who we are. We don't have to be the upper echelon of society. If you send an invitation to Jesus, Jesus will show up. I bet you think your ordinary situation that needs a miracle is not important enough for the Lord to show up. And if you'll just simply get down on your knees and invite the Lord into your situation, the Lord will show up into your ordinary situation and do some extraordinary things. Jesus goes because he has a very keen interest in the ordinary. But then the text is also tailored to teach us and reveal the purpose of Jesus in the world. Uh, Christ did not come to steal, kill, and destroy. He is here to transfigure and transform. He gives new glory to everything upon which he lays his hands. He lifts the lowly higher. He turns deserts into gardens. And if you'll allow the Lord to touch your life, allow him to touch your situation, he'll turn your sorrow into joy. He'll turn your darkness into light. He'll turn your tears into happiness. He'll turn your sin into salvation. Then the text also reveals the method of Jesus. How did Jesus turn the water to wine? You notice verse 5. Uh, we need to understand uh, that supernaturally God, Christ, could have turned the water to wine without any help. 
In fact, uh, God, if he wanted to, uh, could have saved us without having even sent Jesus in the world. Uh, God could minister to a hurting world uh, without even involving the church. But guess what? God always involves human assistance and human hands. When the multitude needed to be fed, he called upon the disciples to get them to sit down. He asked a lad to provide his lunch and church. What the text is teaching us is that if we are going to be a conquering church, if we are going to be the light of the world, we have got to be the eyes and the ears and the mouth and the hands of the Lord. And the results, my friend, not only that we have wine, but there's wine enough to spare. He is a Christ of abundance. Uh, he does not just give us space. He gives us the universe. Not just stars, but galaxies. Not just uh, a few flowers, but he arranged the hills. Uh, not just water, but he gives us oceans. When God touches, he lavishes. When he transforms, he gives more than we need. In fact, when it was time for us to be saved and to be part. He did not just give us Moses, did not just give us Joshua, did not just give us a prophet, did not just give us Mary, but he gave us his best. Gave us Jesus Christ. My friends, notice that wine was required, but the wine in the text at the feast was exhausted. Now, the wine running out may not mean a whole lot to us. Because when we run out of wine, all we got to do is make a trip to the store. And in fact, the stores stay open later than it used to stay open. Even the store is open on Sunday right now. You run out, all you got to do is go to the store. But during those times, if you ran out, it was an embarrassing situation because you could not easily remedy the situation. My friends, it was a serious matter because a lack could not be easily remedied. A shortage would prove embarrassing. But we also notice in the Bible that wine was a symbol of joy. The rabbi said that without wine, there is no joy. No wine, no joy. We see the symbol of wine further in the Bible. Psalm 104, verse 15 says, or which praises the Lord of glory for wine that gladdens the heart. In Judges chapter 9 and verse 13, it says, Should I give up wine which cheers both gods and men? In Isaiah 55 and verse 1, it says, Come by wine and milk without cost. John, my friend, sees the spiritual meaning in ordinary events. And what he's teaching us is this. Apart from Jesus, there is no joy. What we are capable of doing on our own is limited. Your good times will run out without Jesus. Mary said they have no wine. Jesus said, Mama, it's not my time. But Mary said, no, son, now, son, is your time. And notice the significance. The text says in verse 10 that the wine was not just average wine. Uh, the text says it was good wine. Uh, it was the best. And God is not just saving a little something for you. Uh, God is saving something for you that is his best. But then we notice also, my friends, the quantity. Because the Bible says there were six stone jars. And if we calculated, each one of the six jars held 20 to 30 gallons of wine. So Jesus produced 120 to 180 gallons of wine. Jesus is interested in producing in abundance. And my friends, I don't know what you lost in 2020, but we serve a God who will give us his best and save it for last. 
uh, when I look at the story of Job, uh, any of us had been writing, we would have wanted to experience Job chapter 42 before we experienced Job chapter 1. In fact, we would edit out Job chapter 1 because we don't want to go through the suffering and trial. We just want the blessing of Job chapter 42. But I'm so thankful that God don't listen to us. Yes, he takes us through some heartache. Yes, he takes us through some pain. But I look forward to my Job chapter 42 when God saves the greater for later. And somebody needs to know today that God has saved the best for last. Good Friday was not pretty. Saturday was not pretty. But oh, I'm so thankful that Friday and Saturday led to glorious Sunday morning. Guess what? Your weeping may endure for a night, but joy, 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 joy comes in the morning. God saves his best for last. God is saving his best for you. God's best is Jesus. And at Christmas, we celebrate the birth of God's best. And God's best was born in order that you might be transformed into being God's best. All you've got to do is believe that Christ is your Savior and Redeemer, and you shall be saved. Many of you have asked and inquired, how can I become a member of the body of Christ? How can I become a member uh, of a local church? Well, listen, uh, we want you to receive Christ right now because Christ is offering his love. And if you already received Christ's love in the form of salvation, we want you to become a member of our church. Here's what you need to do. You simply uh, need to call our church office. You'll see it uh, on the screen. You need to email our church. But also, you'll see church emails provided for our church clerk and also our membership ministry chair. Just call them, send them an email, let them know that you have accepted Christ as Savior so they can correspond. Let them know you're saved and you want to be a member of our church so they can correspond and then we can celebrate your new life in Christ and celebrate your membership in the church. God bless and may God keep you.